Welcome to the Informed Simplicity Project, a place for students looking for the informed simplicity on the far side of complexity. Today I have Tony Rumanier, who I'm so excited to have on the podcast, um, who's done a lot of research and work with therapists, tracking their outcomes and looking at um, effectiveness. So Tony, if you would like to say hi and give us a brief uh, introduction. Uh, well, thank you for having me, Jordan. This is really exciting. Uh, I, uh, I'm honored to be here. Um, I am a clinical faculty at University of Washington uh, here in Seattle, where I also have a private practice. Uh, though most of my time these days is spent uh, doing training on deliberate practice, which we could talk about a little bit, research on deliberate practice, and then writing books and, you know, stuff like that. Yeah. So how did you get into the field? Uh, I did a bunch of therapy when I was younger. Um, that was mostly helpful. Uh, I'm happy to report. It really saved my butt in some important ways and um, made a big difference for me. And it's the kind of thing I felt just really drawn to. Like I really wanted to to do it and it took me a while to feel ready it wasn't until my really mid later 30s that I felt like ready to go to graduate school and um and do this line of work yeah I think you talked a lot, little bit about this because you had an article in the Atlantic I want to say yeah which um was one of those ser serendipitous things for me because then when I heard about you I was like I know this guy sounds so familiar <laughs> how have I and then I re realized I'd read the article um oh, cool. yeah which everyone should should check out it's it's a really great article thank you um and I guess the question is like what you what did you do in that gap period because you talk about how you went into therapy and then you became a therapist but in the middle what were you what were you doing Oh, I was doing all kinds of adventures. Uh, I, uh, I, I drove a, a hippie uh, adventure tour bus. Um, I uh, started a, uh, like a nerd game company, like a Dungeons and Dragons company with a few friends. I, I did a, a number of odd jobs uh, all over the place, only some of which can go on my resume. Um, and, uh, and I, I just wanted to, you know, adventure, and I, I really didn't feel ready for the responsibility of being a therapist, basically being like steady and dependable and consistent for people um, in, until my, really my mid thirties. And, you know, we're, we're lucky. I was lucky that, you know, psychotherapy is the kind of field you can join halfway through your life or even midlife. Like it's not, you know, age is not held against you in our field, unlike unlike many other fields, so. Yeah, um, so, you, so you really knew that you wanted to be a counselor eventually. Wow. Yeah, I, I mean, uh, it, it crystallized over time, but uh, it was percolating in the back of my mind since I saw my first therapist as a teenager, uh, and he helped me a lot back then. Um, and, and I was just like, this is fascinating because, you know, he's helping me see things in myself that I had no idea existed. Conflicts I had no idea I had, you know, fears I had no idea I had, resources I had no idea I had. I mean, there's this whole unconscious world we have inside us that we're really generally not tuned into. And I was, I'm just fascinated by that. Yeah. So what actually made you go back to, to school? What actually made you flip the switch and go, okay, I'm going to go back and get this degree? Well, the adventures were really fun for a while, but I, after a while, I felt like I was kind of spinning my wheels. Like I wasn't, I, I was missing uh, uh, a consistent challenge, something that I, that would be challenging that I could build over the years. You know, like I was, I was seeing my peers, like my friends, my age, who had been working at a career for like 10 or 15 years. And at that point, you know, in their mid thirties, they were starting to get like good at it, you know, like they were really, uh, you know, and it's, it's not just like the money or whatever. It's also like being like getting good at something, you know, getting good at a skill that is in demand that makes a difference in people's lives. 
And the thing about doing a new job every few years is it's great for like worldly experience and adventure, but you don't end up like getting better at something the way you do is if you just really pound away at it for 10 or more years. And so I was like, I want to, you know, I really want to dive into this. And, um, and it turns out psychotherapy is a, you know, if you want to pick a hard skill to get good at, <laughs> I, you know, I, I think it's a good one. Going. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, maybe it's easy for some people and God bless them, but like, it wasn't easy for me. Yeah. <laughs> Oh yeah. man, I love what you're saying because it, I mean, it, it reminds me of something that um, I heard once. They said youth must be sacrificed. Mm. Youth must be sacrificed for something. Mm. And what you want to sacrifice for is, is mastery. Mm. Um, that's really stuck with me because I had some of the same experiences, I think, on the, on, the, on the other side of, man, like, I can go and have fun and enjoy myself, but well, it's going to be something that I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to be good at. And that can help people that can, can give back to the, to the, to the world. That's a great quote. I've never heard that before, but yeah, that's, that's a really powerful quote. On, I, I really agree. Yeah. So you, so what's your uh, license then? So uh, I got, I'm licensed as a psychologist in the state of Washington. Um, I got a PsyD, which is like the, the non-research, you know, doctorate. Um, which is funny time, now. Yeah. What's that? I said, that's kind of funny now. <laughs> yes, it is. Because at the time I was like, I don't want to do research. Research lame. Like, you know, I just want to like help people. And, you know, it, you know, lo and behold, like a few years after I graduate, I start doing all this research. Um, but it goes to show, and this is something cool about our, you know, line of work. You know, in, you know, once you get a degree, whether it's a master's or doctor, it really doesn't matter. Like you can, you know, you can make anything of it. Like if you decide you want to go into research, you know, 10 years after graduating, you can make that work. Uh, you know, but some of my favorite supervisors, like John Fredrickson, who I've written about a lot, uh, my favorite supervisor I've ever had has a master's of social work. It's a master's degree. And he's doing research. He's teaching, you know, therapists all over the world. They fly him to Europe for months every year to train people. And everyone he's training is a psychologist or a psychiatrist, you know? So the degree, it, I mean, what really matters is how hard are you working? How uh, persistent are you? How dedicated are you? And, you know, that's what will get you somewhere like the, uh, which, which I really love, you know? Um, so. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. And I love that mindset too, because I think a lot of students get out and then they don't know what to do. Mm. And part of what you're saying is you can do a lot of different things if you're willing to really work, work really hard for it. Yeah. I mean, a lot of people, when they, you know, when you get out of school, often what's like top of mind is like, okay, I got to make some money. I got to like support my family. Pay off all like, these student pay, loans. Pay off these up. loans, you know. <laughs> and yeah. so, you know, yeah, when I graduated, I was like, okay, I got to like get clients. I got to get a practice going. I got to, you know, do that. And that's what I really focused on. And that was great. Um, but over time, I decided to gradually add more and more research in. And, you know, there's always research projects you can get involved in. And, you, you know, you can find my advice for anyone who wants to dabble in research is to find a researcher who you really respect, who you like a lot. Um, and, uh, ask them if you can, you know, just help them with a project. Like that's what I did for a number of years is I just helped like very successful researchers with projects. I kind of like attached myself to them, you know, like a lamprey or something and just like, you know, use them as my like alternative, like, you know, research graduate degree. And over time I absorbed it. Um, and, uh, people were typically very responsive. So. Yeah. So you go into get your d degree, come out with a with a PsyD. And how do you like what do you do then? Cuz eventually you get into this deliberate practice part of the field, but before you get to that like like what happens that you go I've got to figure out this deliberate practice deal. So, uh when I started my practicum, which was, you know, how we uh get uh, clinical experience in a PsyD program when we start seeing clients. Um, originally, I was super confident, right? Like originally, I was like, oh, I'm a I know, you know, I got this, like, I know what I'm doing, like, you know, I, 
like it's not going to be an issue. And I had some clients that responded very quickly, like initially. And so I was like, oh, this is great. Like I totally got this. And then over time, uh, I started to get the nagging feeling that, you know, not all my clients were actually doing well, you know, responding well to therapy. And, you know, it's continued throughout my practicum and internship. And, uh, and so what I started to do at one point was to track my own outcome data which means wow. I was giving my clients outcome measures. This is like a little survey they complete before every session. The one which, I was uh, using. Yeah. Which, which measures? Which one? The, it was called the uh, outcome rating scale. And it's a one page measure. It's free to download, free to use. Uh, it was developed by Scott Miller and Barry Duncan. They both have websites where they describe it. Uh, and it's a great introductory measure. Um, it's very easy to use for the therapist and the clients. And I start, I asked my clients to take this measure. It's kind of funny, actually. I, um, I was working at community mental health and I asked my supervisor whether I could use this measure with my clients. And she's like, she was very supportive of it, but she's like, I got to ask, you know, my, her boss, the clinic manager, who then asked the city lawyer and the lawyer said no. And I was like, why not? And they're like, well, if something goes wrong, we don't want a written record of it. And so, <laughs> so what I did, uh, which, you know, I didn't tell anyone, is I created, uh, you know, those whiteboards you can make that are erasable. I just copied the measure onto the whiteboard and then so I could get it from the client each session and then like write down my data and then erase it. You know, and so yeah. it was effect it was effectively black market client outcome data. <laughs> <laughs> like Which is awesome. <laughs> like, you know, who knew that existed? Yeah. But I had it. And so over time I was tracking how my clients were doing. And one of the cool things about doing that is after, you know, a year or two, when you have enough data from enough clients, you can pool it together, aggregate it, and get a sense of how I how I was doing as the therapist, right? Where the majority of my clients were their symptoms getting better, staying the same, or getting worse over time, right? Yeah. And uh, what I found was that, uh, to my horror, was about half of my clients were not improving, uh, which was quite shocking. Yeah. And because, you know, I was not, you know, when you read books on psychotherapy, you don't hear them talking about how half their clients are not improving. You know? <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm aware. Yes. I'm aware. yes. I'm you aware. know, they're like, oh, I've got this model of CBT that's amazing. Here's like 10 examples about how it just transformed someone's life or I've been using EFT and it's, it's incredible. You know, everyone's just selling their stuff, you know. I can tell you my own example of this was uh, I read Paradox and Counter Paradox by the Milan team. You know, and um, I went to an, an MFT program and it's classically trained, incredible book. And I was like, this is it. This is the way. Every single story was. And then if you read their later book, I think it's like family, a systemic harpoon into family games. They abandoned a lot of their old stuff because it was 50% yeah. effective. Like right. Sometimes it'd be great. Right. Sometimes it wouldn't work and they couldn't right. figure out why. <laughs> yeah, right. But no one talks about that. But no one's going to talk about it. Right. <laughs> no about yeah. That. Yeah, it's just, it's just this big, like, unspoken, like, secret, you know, and the experience people kind of know, but they don't talk about it. But the us poor trainees are stuck when, you know, when I realized that half my clients weren't improving, I thought it was me. Yeah. Like, I thought there was something seriously wrong with me. Like, I was not cut out for this. So I didn't want to talk about it in supervision. I didn't want to, you know, and, uh, but then I started to read the outcome literature and see that that's actually average, like across, yeah. like you, like you were saying in your model in CBT, psychodynamic therapy, it, you know, you name the model, like that's the average outcomes. Yeah. And, uh, and something I want to emphasize is that, you know, there are many physicians, there are many, you know, medical doctors that would love to have a 50% success rate. Yeah. No, I think that's the other thing that is underrated is, um, how good that actually is. Yeah. But we talk about it as though it's 100%. R right. Which, which, which then distorts the whole It map. distorts this whole thing. It, like, I, we should feel good about 50%. We're providing a, a low-cost, very low-cost treatment 
very low chance of side effects. We're helping people that often have been struggling for decades, you know, multiple problems. You know, it's not like when you go to the doctor, it's like, oh, I have a broken leg or I have, you know, this or that. You know, when someone shows up for therapy, they often have like a lot of everything, you know. It, and so 50% is great. It's just somehow we've convinced ourselves that anything less than 100% is like super failure. And I, that's a cultural problem. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that's, um, I heard that the, so there's this replication crisis in psychology, right? Which came out of first replication crisis in medicine in yeah. general. And if yeah. you actually look at the outcomes of a lot of medical pr pr procedures, yeah. they're well below 50%. If yeah. they replicate. Yeah, right. So if they your, replicate at all. Right. So to your to your to your very point, that's really good. It's really Yeah, good. I yeah, I mean it it uh as a field, I think we're doing very, very well. Yeah. Personally, I we was want like, to do better. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, it hurts because I really wanted to help my clients. You know what I mean? It's not like I was just selling insurance policies or whatever, and I was like, oh, I missed a sale, whatever. Like each person really matters when you're a therapist, you know. So, so then you, so how did that lead you into the deliberate practice stuff? Okay, so, so what I, you know, originally did was like, okay, how do you become a better therapist? I'm like, I'm gonna, you know, read every book I can get my hands on, right? So I've just, I read, 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 read. I went to workshops. I did all that stuff, and then, uh, and, you know, and that got me really good at talking about therapy. <laughs> I could write really good therapy. Uh -huh. I could debate You're an like what therapy commentator <laughs> exactly. I could comment. I could I could debate really good therapy like CBT psychodynamic blah blah blah. But like if you watch an actual video of my session, like it was nothing like what I was writing or talking. About. <laughs> you know, it, it and it's like the co my cognitive ability, my cognitive understanding of therapy kept going up while my actual what we call procedural ability or my skill at actually doing it was just like totally flat. And th this was really frustrating. Um, so then, then I really doubled down on supervision. You know, I, I've, I've done some research on supervision. One of the cool things about researching supervision is you find it's one of the very few points of agreement across the field. You know, you know we love to argue what's the best model of therapy, CBT, psychodynamic, blah, 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 blah. But if you ask the leading researchers of all the different models, one point they all agree on is that supervision is a essential, if not the essential method of training. In fact, the only people who question the effectiveness of supervision are supervision researchers, because we have seen the data. <laughs> and we've seen that while supervision can help. It doesn't always help. It doesn't always help. Exactly. And by help, I mean improve client outcome. Yeah. Right? Right. That's, right. The bottom that's, line. The, that's the other thing, right? It's like a, it, in terms of helping therapists to not feel burnt out or, or, to, or to continue to provide care, it does really well. But when it comes to what you're saying, Bingo. improving outcomes, Bingo. it doesn't always help. Bingo. Yeah. And, you know, this is a little shocking. Like, let's say I was you know, learning football and I was getting football coaching, like, you know, I would get better steadily. I might not ever get to like the NFL or whatever, but I would gradually become a better football player. Like, you know what I mean? Like, uh, and that is not true for psychotherapy. Uh, not everyone gets better through graduate school supervision and training. And it's a little shocking. Yeah. So, so what did you do? <laughs> so it was around like an this, epic journey. I like love this. It, right there's now. a bit of a yeah. There's a, a bit of a torture journey. I here. read the books. It didn't work. I got the vision. It didn't work. What's the what's the next? So at this time, I was uh, just you know go, listening to. I just got all these workshops on on tape. You know, there wasn't like YouTube and stuff back then, or it was like just barely starting. So it was all like, you know, I, I don't even know if there was podcasts back then. It was like these whatever interviews on and so i was listening to a lecture by scott miller who was talking about who's done a lot of uh work on what's called feedback informed treatment which is like collecting outcome data and using that to improve treatment 
And he, he was noting that while the feedback informed treatment is really good at helping therapists identify clients who might be deteriorating, which happens to be a blind spot of ours, therapists, um, it didn't really help therapists know what to get better at to, to keep them from deteriorating, to help them more. And he, would, he suggested that therapists use deliberate practice. And this is the first time I heard of it. And so what's deliberate practice? So, so Jordan, let me, let me ask you, have you ever played a sport? Yes. I what have. sports? I was a hurdler back in, back in high school. Oh, great. A hurdler. Okay. So you competed? I assume you meets yeah, or? I did. Yeah. Okay. We had track, track meets back in the day. Track meets. Okay, great. And um, here's a thought experiment. Imagine you went to your track coach and you said, you know, coach, I, I love this sport. Uh, in fact, I, I, you know, I think I'm pretty good at it. In fact, I think I want to be professional one day. But I just want to be totally upfront and honest. I don't have time to practice. Like I got school, I got my family, you know, I, I, I you know, I got this job. I, I, I just can't do it. So how about instead of practicing, I just show up for the meets, and then we meet once a week for an hour or two and discuss how I did in the meet, and I do that for a few years. Uh, and over, over the course of a few years, I get a few thousand hours of supervised, uh, sport performance. Would that get me, you, meaning you to a professional level, uh, track ability? What would your coach say? Um, <laughs> he would just look at me like I was stupid. <laughs> My coach would have thought, what? Yeah, what are you talking about? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah, there's no way. There's no way. The, the way you get better at a sport, uh, and there's no, like, it's not optional, <laughs> is you practice the heck out of it. I mean, how many hours, what was the ratio, do you think, of hours of practice to hours of meets? Oh, practice every day for two hours. So that's 10 hours a week. And okay. then you have a meet. Um, and, you know, track meets, you might do three events. And with warm up and everything, you probably all total or practice it or warming up and running for maybe an hour total. So like 10 hours of practice to one to one, 10 to one. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And now it's at the high school level. What do you mm -hmm. think it's like at the professional level? Professional level. It's probably the same amount of practice, but they're probably doing more recovery. They're probably eating better. They're probably doing much more weights. There's a whole Palestine. kind of, so they're going to be doing stuff. less. Yeah, they're probably right. going to be. I know I have a buddy who did some stuff, and he would do. They would have two or three, three hour practice, two or three practices a day. Oh my gosh! Um, and one of those they'd be doing the actual sport, and then the other times they'd be doing right drills or kinesthetics right. or uh, right. I mean, calisthenics right. or something else to augment. Which, which I would just call different forms of practice. They're yeah. Yeah. they're drilling down on very very discreet. Yeah. uh ways to improve because like every little percentage the improvement counts at that level right right yeah so um now imagine that your coach in high school asked you to compete without practicing do, do you think you could have been a good competitor like do you think you would have st stood a chance no 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 it's, okay I mean, it's not even like a <laughs> basic cardio question. i wouldn't have basic cardio right like, I mean, it's I not even a question <laughs> yeah okay did you ever learn a musical instrument i did when i was what, in middle school what the, instrument the recorder the pain of, of every parent <laughs> <laughs> right, <laughs> right yeah we've recorder. all got like recorder ptsd <laughs> now I, imagine you wanted to play the recorder professionally and you went to your music teacher and said teacher i love this i want to play professionally but to be honest, I don't have time to practice. You know, I got school, I got family. How about I just perform at recitals once a week and you supervise me and would that get you to a professional level music ability? My parents would have shot me. <laughs> 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 All right. All right. Now, would you say that psychotherapy is a lot easier than playing the recorder or track? Oh, it's much harder. So 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 what are we doing because we're asking trainees to do this incredibly hard skill psychotherapy 
but we're not asking them to practice. We're not, we're not setting them to practice when we would never consider that for, for athletics or music. Yeah. Well, I mean, in to play devil's advocate, cause obviously I'm bought into yes. the idea, right. But to play devil's advocate, people are, are going to say things like, um, well, you know, therapy isn't like other things, you know, right. It's, it's this personal connection, right? Like, how would you even practice that? You know, it's right. all about you being a person, not doing a procedure. Right. Right. And, and that is a very valid concern. It's, it's very true. I mean, there's really nothing is like psychotherapy. There, there's a number of ways that psychotherapy is different. We, we, uh, well, first of all, with track, like, you know, you know exactly what the root is, <laughs> right? Right. In psychotherapy, we don't know what the root is. <laughs> like, I mean, we might hope we know what the root is, but usually we don't. You know, in fact, we don't even know what the sport is. Like the client, you know, one week might want help with, you know, their girlfriend. The next week, they're like, actually, today I want to talk about something completely different. And, you know, and so, uh, it, so first of all, it's, it's new every time. It's improvised every time. It, you know, when I was trying to become better, I would memorize transcripts. I'd read through like books by Beck and, you know, famous therapists and see what they said. And I'd memorize it and say it to my clients. And can you guess how well that worked? <laughs> I love your dedication. It's so cool to see someone who's like, man, I will literally try anything. I was desperate. I was desperate. <laughs> what will get me over 50%? And, and no, it didn't work at all. In fact, I had clients say, like, Tony, it sounded like you memorized that. <laughs> you know? Because it's not me. It was great for Beck, but it's not me. Like, we all have a personal style, you know? It's such a personal art. I mean, it's an art form, you know, as much as a science, right? Yeah. So, so it's, it's different every time. It's improvised every time. It's got, you know, loosely defined goals at best. Uh, it, and not only that, uh, psychotherapy, as far as I can tell, is the only field where we really have to sit with someone who's who can be in pretty intense emotional pain and attune with their pain without trying to just make it stop mm. right mm. like if, if let's say let's say you get hit by a car and you're in pain and the ambulance shows up they're going to just try to make your pain stop you know and they're not really going to like dialogue with you about it a lot <laughs> you know what i mean tell like, me how that feels Where exactly you feel that that. in your body they're not gonna do all that <laughs> they're just gonna try to make it stop try to get to the hospital like be done with it right same with the doctor same with whoever like we don't have that luxury you know uh we're, we're kind of like firefighters like imagine a firefighter that like you know goes into a burning building and there's someone in the burning building and you as a firefighter are like, hey, let's run out the door. And the person's like, oh, no, no, no. I've had bad experiences through that door. And you'd be like, okay, well, let's jump out the window. You know, and our, you know the other people catch us on the bouncy thing. And be like, no, 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 I'm scared of heights. We have to be like, okay, well, why don't we sit down in the burning building and build a relationship over a few months while it burns down around us. And then we can, you know, figure out a way you feel comfortable leaving. Yeah. And, and these are incredibly hard skills. I suggest the idea that the idea that we can get better at these hard skills without rehearsing, without practicing is nuts. Yeah. You know, I think what you're saying actually has huge implications, not just for therapy, but for the field of medicine at large. I wrote a report last week that said that um, um, people, what's the word? Adherence to medical treatments across the world. Yeah. It's 50, 50%. Yeah. And, and why is that? Why didn't people not take their full course of the medication? Part of that's how we, how are we presenting it to them? How are we getting them to take the medication? Like, cause it's not, it's in medicine uh, alone, it works to say, just take this. And if they take it, they get better. But there is also a large part in any medical profession where people have to be bought into whatever it is, or you have to yeah. meet them where they are for them to the, take the medication. The personal element. You know, yeah, there's the a study. Yeah. It, a study just came out uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, I think it was from the United Kingdom, where uh, psychiatric nurses were, or no, sorry, it was, it, I 
I think it was cancer nurses. I, I'll, I'll look it up. I'll send it to you. Yeah. We're using deliver practice to practice the people skills involved in nursing. Yeah. And their outcomes were a lot better because it turns out the people skills matter as much as the pills or as, yeah. as much as even surgery. And, yeah. and so this goes, this goes back to you. I, I, I want to, you know, stick to your question, which is, you know, how can we use deliver practice to practice something that says like free form and personal and improvised as psychotherapy, right? Cause that's yeah. a valid question. Well, look, you know, uh, you know, uh, comedians, comedians have a, have a joke list, but they, they improvise, you know, every good comedian, if you listen to an interview with a comedian, they are tuned into their audience and they'll do a little more of this or a little less of this. It's very improvised. And you know what they do? They practice, they practice for hours and hours and hours, you know, improvisit improvisational actors where every performance is new. They practice the heck out of their pieces. Jazz musicians, you know, free form jazz where every performance is new. They practice, and not only that, they practice the basic skills. They, they practice the same basic notes. Because the thing about being a good jazz musician, it's not just getting up there and kind of doing whatever you want. You know what I mean? Like, it's actually, you're improvising, but you're improvising based off of a common uh, skill set that everyone shares. The same with creative artists. You know, if you want to become a professional artist and you go to art school, they're going to ask you to practice. And if you're like, well, I'm just going to express myself creatively, you know, they're going to be like, great, you're going to do it somewhere else, you know, but to be good at it, you got to practice the basic skills. And I suggest it's the same for psychotherapy. We, we got to figure out what are the basic skills of psychotherapy and help trainees practice those. So then they're improvising kind of on top of those skills. So what are the basic skills? Yeah, great question. <laughs> uh, so the, the short answer is we're still figuring that out. There's a set of, so originally people were convinced that the key to psychotherapy was picking the right model, right? So, you know, way back in Freud's, 100 years ago, they thought it was psychoanalysis. And then the CBT behavioral people came along with those behaviors and then the CBT people and then you know, one after another, after another, right? Now there's hundreds of models of therapy that have been uh, validated through empirical studies as effective. But it turns out that if you compare them all to each other, you know, each, each model has a few studies showing it's like a miracle, but really when you add enough studies together, they're all roughly equivalent. And what matters is the, the therapist and the client and the match, right? So then they started looking at what are, what, are, what are the quote unquote common factors across the models that really matter the most. And Bruce Wampold has a great book on this called The Great Psychotherapy Debate. Yeah. Uh, highly recommended where there's a list of, of common factors that you could consider the basic elements in therapy. So it's, you know, empathy, uh, a, setting a, a good goal with the client collaboratively, uh, attunement, you know, stuff like that. Yeah. Um, so how does that, I mean, those are, those are, what does that look like though on a practical level, right? Because people Great are going to say, hey, I feel like I'm attuned. I feel like I'm Great. empathy. So in, in some ways, those are almost labels for smaller skills, for micro skills. I don't know. How would you talk about yeah, so there's a few things, first of all. So unfortunately, it doesn't matter if the therapist feels attuned. What matters is if the client feels attuned. And uh, when you start collecting client feedback, you'll find if you ask the therapist and the client to rate the same session, like the session ends, immediately after the session, you give them both a piece of paper and write down how attuned they were, they give totally different answers. <laughs> it's pretty remarkable. I will routinely, when therapy ends, even when it ends successfully, I'll ask my clients, what was the most valuable thing we did in therapy? And they will say things that I, I was totally not expecting. And, you know, I had a client tell me, you know, the most valuable th thing you did, Tony, was when you smiled. And I was like, oh my gosh, here I am spending thousands of dollars on all this advanced training. And like, really what I have to do is just remember to smile more, you know? <laughs> 
And, but then other clients will be like, I, I hate it when you smile because, you know, it just seems like you're trying to convince me to be happy. You know what I mean? Like what I really appreciate is when you let me just like cry for an hour or whatever. So it's just really, really personal. So, um, so to go to your question, yes, we, what we want to do is we, the big constructs like have a good working alliance or a good relationship is too big, right? That would be like asking you to practice as a track player, just like run faster. I mean, sure. I mean, it's, it's a good idea, but that's not going to help you become better, right? The way the coach would help you be better would be like, lift your knee a little when you're doing this or, you know, breathe a little deeper or whatever it was, right? Like really specific micro skills, right? Right. And so what we're trying to do now is figure out what are the micro skills that ther the counselors can practice so that when they're sitting with clients, they can feel more confident, they can feel more comfortable, and they have a better chance of uh, having a, the client having a good experience. And so what, there's different approaches to this. There's a bunch of different research teams working on different ways of doing this. Uh, what, what I'm involved in, right, and this is early. This is gonna take us, honestly, 10, 20 years to figure out. Oh my God. I'm sorry if that's disappointing. It is disappointing. Because <laughs> I'm like you, I wanna get good at this. But it's a long time look, to wait. I'm sorry, we're in a young field, you know? Like a hundred years ago, Freud was still running around doing his thing. Like, you know, I mean, it took him, it took him hundreds of years to figure out how to practice athletics. It took him thousands of years to figure out how to practice music. Like it's going to take us a few decades to figure this out. So, uh, but what, what I'm involved, the project I'm involved in now is we're doing a series of books for the American Psychological Association where, where we've asked some of the leading uh, authors and researchers of the major therapy models like emotion focused therapy, CBT, psychodynamic therapy, to identify 10 or 12 key essential skills for their model. And then we're creating exercises so they can practice those micro skills. So for the emotion focused therapy book, there are five different exercises just on different kinds of empathy, five different kinds of empathy. Wow. Yeah. Who knew? Right. There, there's yeah. empathy when you're just meeting someone. There's empathy when you're pushing a little harder. There's empathy when you're pushing a little harder than that. There, I mean, there's. And uh, now these are skills from the models. But remember, the models actually don't matter that much. What we're basically doing is the model provides a framework so people can practice the common factor skills. That doesn't that doesn't make sense to me. So the, the thing with the common factors is individually they make sense, like empathy makes sense, setting goal, having good relationship. But, you know, many counselors will notice if they sit down with a client and they just try to do these skills kind of haphazardly, it doesn't feel like organized. The clients are kind of like, what are we doing? Why are we doing this? Like, how does this help? Why does this help? Like many clients are like, how is therapy actually going to help? Right. And what the model does is it pro provides a cohesive story, so to speak, for how is this going to help? You know, this is the problem you have. This is what we're going to do. And this is how it's going to help. And having that story or narrative helps both the client and therapist kind of understand what's the, you know, what are we doing and why are we doing it? And that's why you need the uh, model. That's model, why you need a model. The model gives you the structure for all the interventions, but the interventions yeah. really work because of the common factors. Bingo. The mo yeah, the danger is that people start to worship the model as almost like a false idol, when really the model is just like a story, you know, or a structure that kind of holds it all together in a way that makes sense. Because therapy should make sense to the client. If a client doesn't understand what's going on, the odds they're going to benefit are lower and the odds are going to drop out or higher you're hitting on something that personally has been something that i've been doing a lot more of and i'm so glad to hear you say that because i've 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 heard a lot of people say i don't know what we're doing in therapy and the mm. therapist knows the right. therapist has a clear idea uh, right whether it's my own clients or whether it's clients of my right colleagues but when i get their clients when i get my own clients and i say what are we doing and they say right 
I'm like, something is not connecting. I got to know where this is going. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, you know, I, I, what, I've tracked my outcome data over a number of years. I put my outcome data on my website because I think it's, you know, it, it's just good for people to see what it can be like. And when I originally added up my uh, dropout rate in graduate school, um, it, it was like at times like over 20%, you know, I honestly, some weeks it felt like it was 50%. I mean, it was crazy and people just like wouldn't come back. And anecdotally, in my experience, the people who don't come back are the people who have no idea what we're doing. And they're like, why am I doing this? And there's enough bias against mental health treatment already. Like it's important that people understand. And that's where the model comes in. The model will say, this is what we're doing. And this is why we're doing it. So is that related to Jerome Frank's sort of idea? Um, yeah. 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 So let yeah. me ask this question. A myth. This is, he used the myth. term a myth, right? Yeah. yeah. The model is a myth. You need an, an orienting story that, that makes sense of people's suffering and then Bingo. tells them what will change, what, what they need to do in order to change. Bingo. So this is a little bit of a, of a, a side note, but it's related. When you track people over time in therapy, you also see that people who do well often do well early. And that there's a huge number of people who are rapid responders who have sudden, sudden gains and, and do really well early on. How do you distinguish between those people, the people who just drop out? So that's a really good question. Uh, and the uh, unfortunate answer is uh, I don't have a good way to do that yet. And that has been very, very frustrating. Uh, I've had clients who I thought dropped out because like two or three sessions in, they just stopped coming. And I was like, oh, that's a dropout. Like I screwed something up. And then two years later, they come back and they're like, oh yeah, I stopped coming because I was doing better. And now something else has come up. I mean, look, if, if I have an appointment with the doctor and I'm feeling better, I don't like go to still go to the doctor you know what i mean i cancel it <laughs> you know what i mean like or just no show <laughs> or just no show exactly no show. exactly so you know th that's that's tough i mean we can try calling all our clients who no show but you know we don't want to like hound people and you know harass them to like you know what i mean like so uh it, it's man if you can figure that out please let me know I will. Uh, I'm. I'm working on it. I'll, uh, <laughs> okay. I'll let great. You know. Great. Okay. So, deliberate practice. Why don't? Can you just um, define it a little bit more? I think it's clear to me, but I want to make sure people listening have a really good understanding of what it is. Yeah. So, and there's also there's videos and lectures and stuff on my website. You know where people can kind of dig into it. So, but deliberate practice is. Uh, uh, defined by five steps. It was invented, the term was invented uh, by Kay Anders Erickson, a psychologist uh, in Florida. Of course, deliberate practice has been used for, for millennia, I, you know. Um, so uh, deliberate practice is five steps. Uh, first, you uh, observe work. Ideally, it's through video. Uh, and this is an issue we have sometimes in psychotherapy training, is we just take notes you know, which really does not capture a lot of what goes on in therapy, no matter how hard you're trying to remember it. Uh, two, um, you uh, identify, uh, you get feedback on your work from a expert coach, right? Like a supervisor. We're typically pretty good at that. Three, you identify a, a micro skill, like you said earlier, to work on right, to, to practice, something to get better at. And we want that skill to be just beyond someone's ability, right? Like okay. if it's too far, it won't help. If it's, if it's too easy, it won't help either. You want it to be just beyond your ability. Four, we rehearse it a lot, right? Like we were saying with track or, or whatever, you want to rehearse as much as possible. And then five, you assess the results which is trickier in psychotherapy. You know, when you're playing track, uh, track meet, it's easy to assess results because they literally just time you, right? Yep. Uh, recorder, it's easy because people are listening. With psychotherapy, it's tough because we kind of operate in this 
secret world where it's hard to really assess. Yeah. And so I mean, sometimes through, clients don't always know either. And clients don't even know, like, because it's all so confusing and sometimes there's a lot of shame involved and you know what I mean? So it's, it's just tougher for psychotherapy, for counseling. And so these five steps are repeated throughout a career, right? If someone joins the NFL or the NBA, they don't stop practicing, right? They practice more. I've arrived, so I don't need to practice anymore. Exactly. Exactly. Oh, I'm done with that. <laughs> right? I mean, you know, so uh, it repeats throughout a whole career. And that's, you look, if you want to be a chess professional chess player, that's what you do. If you want to be a professional pilot, it's what you do. If you, you know, all these different professions. Uh, but somehow we, we haven't done that. In counseling, we've really focused on you read a lot, you write a lot, you talk a lot, but, but you don't rehearse a lot. So how, how, how have you seen the reception to your uh, work? Uh, it's a little bit of both. So the idea often intuitively makes sense when they think about, you know, when someone thinks about like, oh yeah, I would never think about being a professional athlete or a musician without practicing, of course. But then uh, people ask like, well, but how do I do it? You know? And then there's other questions. How am I going to find time to do it? You know, how, you know what I mean? Yeah, we are busy. in a very odd field that's high on performance. But, you know, if you're seeing clients 25 hours a week, right, you have to then find time when to practice. Like, there's also right. a logistics issue. Right. And so that's what we're figuring out now. And so there's been a few studies recently that have come out that have explored, okay, if we try integrating deliberate practice into training, this is how it works. This is how it doesn't work. If we're trying to use it at a clinic with licensed therapists, this is how it works, this is how it doesn't work. And we found out it's really complicated. And like I said, we're, we're just kind of getting into it, which, uh, you know, for me is exciting to be like on the cutting edge of something that could hopefully really transform the field. Uh, it just means we have to be modest about what we expect to get from it. You know, it's gonna take some time. Yeah. But like on our website, we have exercises people can try and, you know, we're, we're, we're just experimenting with it, with it a lot. Yeah. Hmm. So let's, let's take this full, full, full circle. Where are your outcomes now? Uh, well, there's good and bad news uh, <laughs> regarding that. It's, if, if you go to my website, it's, you can kind of track the trajectory of my outcomes. Cause, uh, so I started posting my outcomes from private practice where I was actually doing pretty well. And then after a few years, I moved to Alaska because my wife got a job there. And my outcomes dropped in half, wow. like literally in half. And it's hard to know, did I get a lot worse? I mean, I, you know, I was not super happy in Alaska. Like, it's, it's tough for me, at least, living in central Alaska. And some people love it. You know, that's great. But uh, for me, it was tough. So maybe I just wasn't as effective or maybe people were struggling with harder things. It's, it's a little hard to know. And then when I got back to Seattle, my outcomes kind of went up a bit. So you know, it kind of recently, however, I haven't added them up for this year because the whole COVID thing and everything. And also over time, I'm seeing fewer and fewer clients because I'm spending more and more time writing books and I'm spending less time practicing myself. And I would expect that means that my skills are actually uh, plateauing or declining. And I would expect over time uh, that I would gradually become a worse and worse therapist which is the opposite. You know, most therapists assume over time they're getting better. The research does not support that. No, I think that's one of the most dis disheartening things in the field is level of degree, time in yeah. the field do not correlate with. Right. And then actually the stuff that I've seen says that it tends to be the graduate students who are, yeah. who are doing better, if not just as good as the yeah. PhDs. Which yeah, is just, which is like, I know yeah. it's a little it's a little disheartening. I mean, the graduate students are really thinking about it. Their heart They'll, is really, yeah. really in it, you know. No. And uh, I, I would suggest that the maybe look, if if professional athletes never practiced, they wouldn't get better either. Right. If professional musicians never practiced, they wouldn't get better. Right. Well, in, in fact, that's that's what happens with with athletes, right? Like you see athletes like Michael Jordan or Kobe Bryant. The reason that they stop playing that their bodies can't take the practice anymore. Bingo, bingo. That's yeah, why they stop. Yeah, it's not because they stop enjoying the sport. It's because they can't tolerate the practice. 
And so they know they're going to start declining and right. they don't want it. Like it would be heartbreaking for them to keep playing like as they get worse and worse and worse right. over the years. Right. Right. It, and so, you know, uh, I, and that's our field is we just don't, we don't rehearse. We, we don't practice. Yeah. Man. <laughs> um, <laughs> I hope I'm not depressing your, uh, your listeners. <laughs> you probably are. <laughs> I personally, you know, maybe I'm just, you know, uh, an optimist, but I find this very exciting because I'm like, oh my gosh, like this might be the way that we unlock all this potential. And maybe a therapist 20 years from now could be better than, than, you know, someone now could ever hope of being. Well, you know, it's so funny you say that because I was, I read this article last night about Tool Gawanda called. Oh yeah. Curve. Yeah. He's great. Yeah. He's incredible. Yeah. And he talks about cystic fibrosis and how, like, in the 70s, um, it was, like, a 3% rate of yeah. people, like, living past the first year. Yeah. But there was this one place that had a 20% rate of people yeah, living right. to, like, 20. Yeah. But, right? And so that, that one agency was so far above everyone else. And then as time has gone on, they've continued to be these outliers to push the envelope, you know? Right. And so it's like, yeah, Absolutely. It, the things now, that will happen in the future will seem magical to the people of the past. Bingo. Now, they were doing something special, though. They were tracking the outcomes of the diff- – if they weren't tracking their outcomes, they would never know that. Right. And they right. needed a bunch of people to be tracking their outcomes right. so they compare it. And we have not done that in psychotherapy. We typically study models, but then we don't study the therapist, which is, yeah. I think, completely upside down. We should be studying the therapist and identifying which therapists are the high performers and then figuring out what are they doing and how can everyone else practice what they're doing. So, so, so look, I mean, this is a great question then. Do you think it would make a big difference if individual agencies did that? Like if I were to go to my agency and say, okay, we're going to give everyone the OQ45-2, whatever version they're on for the next year. And then we're going to blast our outcomes to every insurance agency, to every EAP, to every, you know, r- referral source like do you think people would actually care about that like the the public or uh the short answer is no the public the the public just wants to get better i you know i mean like there's data on on medical outcomes and most people don't check it like it's it's complicated and confusing i mean the oq45 what's that you know i mean it's you know the statistics are hard to read you know i i i had a uh an artist put together a poster of my outcomes. And typically when I show it to people, they're just like, I don't understand what I'm looking at. You know, <laughs> like. <laughs> they instantly <laughs> just zone out. <laughs> they just zone out. You know, the clients are like, are you going to be able to help me or not? Like, I, you know, I can't, you know, get a graduate degree in statistics to figure this out. And so the public, you know, and, but that's okay. Like we don't need the public, you know, to, what, what we need is for the therapists to be able to compare themselves or the clinics to compare themselves with other clinics. At the therapist level, I'd be a little careful because everyone has different caseloads and, you know, that kind of thing. But at least clinics, you know, and what we want to know are, are some clinics just like a few standard deviations better than other clinics? Like, are there real outliers? And That's the whole point of the Gowanda article, right? Like, we, like they are. Bingo. We just don't know where they are yet. Well, we know some of them. I, I actually uh, uh, met a therapist from Australia uh, who uh, last year who um, had such a good success rate that Michael Lambert, the inventor of the OQ45, didn't believe it when she told him. He thought there I, was some I kind read of... this article and I almost crapped my pants. Yeah, it was, it's it incredible. was an incredible article. Yeah, they thought it was some kind of software error. I mean, it was amazing. <laughs> it's just the best story, right? Yeah. Like, why is this program broken? Apparently, yeah. I'm really good. <laughs> yeah. Ari Vlas. I, I contacted her and I was like, can you teach me what you're doing? And uh, I mean, she's amazing. And wow. so she, you've actually met her. Oh, yeah. She actually came to Seattle and wow. I set her up to meet with a few of my clients and I videotaped it to figure out what she's doing. Oh, yeah. my God. Yeah. I'm geeking and, out right now. That's that's it, awesome. Yeah. No, she's 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 incredible. And. I mean, the good news and bad news, uh, the start of the bad news is she's doing so many things so well, so quickly, right away, that it's kind of overwhelming. I mean, it's a little hard, like, <laughs> it's like, I can't do that, you know? Like, it's amazing 
how she's so warm, but her she's so warm, it lets her also be so challenging, like all at once. And her personal integrity is so strong. Like her diet, her like sleep, her like everything is just like, per she's like an Olympic athlete, but for therapists. Right. And, you know, and so, I, and I just I, like, I'm not, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry if that disappoints any of my clients, but like, you know, I mean, I that makes coffee. sense though. <laughs> I mean, like yesterday I had a crappy day in therapy and I yeah. know I woke up and I was just, I was, I didn't sleep well. Yeah, exactly. And so if you take your sleep and your food very seriously so that yeah. you can be yeah. sort of on and alert and present with, yeah. with people, that's going to impact yeah. your, your outcomes. But you know, Jordan, you have a young child at home. Like, good luck sleeping well. I mean, you know what I mean? Like, exactly. <laughs> like, you know, but she has arranged her whole life to, to be as healthy as possible so she can give 110% to the clients. Wow. And they feel it. I mean, it's, it's amazing. You know, I would like be drinking coffee and she'd be like, you can't do that. Like, you know, that'll, that'll make you tired in the afternoon and you won't attune with your client, you know, like. <laughs> I love that. I love that. <laughs> So, oh my gosh. Uh, but there were some things she was doing that I was like, you know, I can get better at this. There's, there were, one thing I noticed from her was that she was, when she was delivering challenge, you know, there's a certain amount of counseling that involves challenge when you have to just call something out, right? You have to be like, look, you know, I know you're blaming your spouse for this, but you're, you know, you're partly at fault too. Like you're involved in these arguments too. Like you're whatever it is, right? And that's a tricky thing in therapy is to, you know, to be honest about the tough truths without coming across as judgmental or right. insulting or, better, or, you know, holier than thou or moralizing, right? And I watched her do this in these videos and she was, she's just a master at that. And so I practiced doing that with videos of my own clients. What would she do? How would she do it? You know, she would do this with this, this kind of warm positivity where she's like, She's like, you know, you're making these mistakes and it makes sense given your history. And what we're going to do is we're going to figure out how you can fix this. Like, we're going to figure out how you can stop making these mistakes. And because you're, you're better than this. Hmm. And it was this kind of this, this kind of almost Tony Robbins kind of like, like, you know, you can do it. We can do it together kind of thing, you know? Wow. And there's, it's almost hard to describe. There's an energy to it. And so I would sit there with videos of my clients and rehearse doing this with the videos, like again and again and again and again, because I myself would drift into sounding like I was criticizing someone or judging someone or, you know, something like that. So. Oh, there you go. Well, look, man, I am, uh, this is so much fun. I'm gonna be respectful yeah. of your time. Um, and I think I also wanna give you the floor. Like, is there anything else you wanna hit on or you feel like people need to know? about deliberate practice and getting better as a therapist? You know, uh, yeah, so the, the key, well, the key takeaways, I would say is first of all, if you have a chance to videotape your work and watch yourself do therapy, seize it. It doesn't have to be all your clients, it could just be one, but seize it. it it's super, super valuable, right? Mm -hmm. Two, Try to find uh, a supervisor, a senior colleague, like someone you really respect, who you feel safe with, who you can show the videos to and get advice. What can you do better? And then three, rehearse it. Don't expect that just because it's in your mind, you'll remember to do it, right? Like typically we have to rehearse things a lot. And so sit there with your video or ask a friend to role play your client and rehearse what you want to do better. And that, that is how you would get better at any other skill. And um, if you notice, if you notice there's certain ways you're not getting better at psychotherapy, like don't get depressed, don't get demoralized. It's not because you're a bad person. It's just because you're not rehearsing it. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so, um, uh, yeah, I, I would say that's the most important takeaway. Beautiful. Um, so, you know, you're on the forefront of, of the field, obviously, if you were to look even to like, you know, the, the forefront of the forefront, what do you think's on the, on the, on the edge? Well, you know, there's some really fascinating technology coming, 
coming along. And now, of course, this whole COVID thing has just like been a, you know, boosted the speed of that, you know, 10x. Uh, and, you know, it's entirely possible we could have some kind of virtual reality therapy or whatever in the future, you know, or that kind of stuff, which I, per you know, my, what I am most excited about is we could have virtual reality clients that we could be rehearsing with, yeah. that we could be making all these mistakes with, you know, uh, so we could flush out our mistakes. Uh, and so I, I'm really excited about that. Hopefully that'll, that'll come soon. Almost like a um, a Star Trek holodeck, yeah. just like therapy. You can just run it and run it and run it and run it. Bingo. Bingo. Yeah, I'm going to try this reflection. I'm going to try it 20 different ways, 20 different times. Do you think that we know enough about people, though? You know, and, and I think that's the other sort of question people have is, do we know enough about people and about mental health that we can actually quantify that? Uh, the short answer is no. <laughs> I mean, uh, like, no, I mean, it's very, very early days. Like, you know, people get all excited about neurobiology, but when you actually look at it, like, it's still very, 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 very early. And, you know, hopefully someday they're really going to understand how the brain works and the personality works. You know, will it be while I'm alive? Probably not. You know, like, yeah. Maybe while my chill, my while my daughter's alive, maybe you know. Now that doesn't mean we should just like give up and <laughs> you know, like uh, I, I still think you know when the when the thermometer was first invented, you know, what was it like 150 years ago or whatever? Like you know, it took people a while to figure out how to use it. You know, people are like, what? There's this weird device we have to use, and they're really long, and they you know they're like should I use it once a week or what, you know, and then they're like, you should use it, you know, twice a day. And they're like, Oh my gosh, that's so often there, you know, there are even some, some doctors were, you know, because before then they were telling temperatures by putting, you know, your, their hand on your head and doctors were saying, well, if we use this thermometer device, it's going to quote unquote de-skill our physicians because they're going to lose the ability to do it by touch. Right. Mm. And so there's this kind of culture change that has to happen as technology, you know, it took them decades to figure out how to really use thermometers. And, and so we're, we are at the beginning of that. We are at the thermometer stage of treatment, of research and development. <laughs> Which, oh, look, if we can be humble, if, if we can, if, if the good news is that psychotherapy works at least 50% of the time, you know? And, and so if we can be humble, if we can be okay with that, I think that's okay. Yeah. Um, what are you, what are you reading? What's on your uh, nightstand? I, uh, so I, I'm involved in this project right now where I, I, I've, I'm kind of going through a lot of the popular like self-help books and I'm trying to identify what are the skills that would be improved through deliberate practice. And so, self-help stuff. Yeah. Well, the self-help is kind of like therapy skills, but then kind of, you know, boiled down to make it kind of more accessible to, to people. Right. And so that's, what's interesting me is how, how can, can that, can those skills get even more, um, can, can, could that benefit from deliberate practice? Mm -hmm. So I'm going, and a lot of people have the experience so they read a self-help book and they're like, this makes a lot of sense. This is great. But then they go and try to do it and they're like, I can't do this or, you know, and so, uh, so, so that's what I'm doing now is kind of going through a bunch of those. Mm. I heard someone say that, uh, that they don't like self-help books because it's always like what to do books, but not how to do. Bingo. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's like, uh, you know, reading a book, you know, by a professional, you know, basketball player on how to like win like NBA games. I mean, it's very interesting, but if you read the book and are just like put in the middle of an NBA game, like <laughs> it's not going to work. <laughs> yeah. Which is, which is really interesting because we're in this weird time, I think in our society Yeah. where lots of people are learning um, so much stuff on the internet. Yeah. You know? And there's a culture, there's a vein of the culture where people really like self hacking, you know? Yeah. Hack right. hack this skill. 
Yeah. And then the other side of that, I think the dark side of that is people are trying to get the mindsets, the mental models, the whatever you want to call it, of people who are successful. Yeah. But if you don't know what they're actually doing to get, you know, in these mindsets, I don't know if it actually translates into something you can actually use. Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, it's great for them. But uh, the, the question is, is, you know, typically if you want to get better at something, you have to practice it. The idea that you can like get better at anything just through like a hack you know, it, I think is, is usually an illusion. Yeah. Um, maybe there's a few things here and there, but, uh, and there's some people that are gifted that, you know, for whatever reason they got there quicker, but usually it's because they worked really hard at it, you know? <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, man, look, thank you so much. Why don't you give us a, a, um, a closing word or a closing thought? Uh, well, I, hey, thank you for having me. This has been a, a really fun conversation. Um, uh, you know, it's great you're doing uh, the series. Um, I'd say if this interests you at all, uh, Deliver Practice interests you at all, go to my website, uh, DP for Therapists. And um, we've got video exercises and all kinds of things that you can try out, read more. And, um, you know, going to your last point, about how kind of young the field is, I, I would encourage your listeners to embrace that. Like sometimes therapists, we can get really insecure. Like somehow we're supposed to like be as far along as medical doctors in development, you know, while they had like a thousand year head start, you know what I mean? <laughs> like it's not gonna happen. Like let's respect who we are. We're, at a, we're in a new field that I personally, frankly believe is a lot harder than medical treatment. Uh, and, you know, em embrace the, the challenge of it. You know, we're, we're really, we're pioneers, you know? Um, so, you know, be humble and uh, just keep trying to get better. Well, thank you so much. Look, I'll link to all this stuff below, um, and I cannot say enough. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Cool. All right. Well, you're welcome, and thank you, Jordan.